morning. My name is Bonnie, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Infrastructure Management Global Community webcast. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, press the bell on the key. Thank you. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Michael Helder. Please go ahead, sir. Thanks, Bonnie. And hello, everyone. Welcome to our August 2014 IAM Community webcast. Our main topic today is using NAST, which many of you might still know as the NFA partner, to verify flows in NFA. And as you can see, we have Stuart Wienick, our communications officer for the community, to share some of his knowledge on this topic with us. But before I hand it over to him, I'd like to quickly go over a few topics from our last uh, community update, which was posted earlier today. Um, first, I can share some of the survey results from our community survey on software-defined networking, which we had running last month. And although we didn't get as many responses as we would have liked and were used to, it did show that most of the companies are either in the early stages of research and development of SDN, or they still have limited or even no information on this concept at all. Um, together with CA, we have scheduled a webcast on this topic for next month, and we have requested to our CA speaker to, to start with the basics of SDN before going into how CA positions their IAM products to manage in uh, SDN environment, environment. Then next, I just wanted to give you a short update on CA World uh, for this year in uh, November. The early birds registration of $200 discount is still available until the end of the month. And for registered community members, you can get an additional $200 discount um, if you register using the link in the CA World community on the website. The session catalog is expected to be online this week, uh, followed by the agenda builder, which should be available around the end of the next week. And then finally, we are also talking with CA about the possibility to host more technical events. Um, some of you might know it from the past as a dev buddy event. We're looking into possibilities of um, CA and the community working together to get something like that organized. If you are interested in something like that, uh, you have some suggestions or something you would like to see there, reach out to us. It only helps us make a case with CA to get something like that organized. Um, we think it would be a great addition uh, to an event like CA World, which many see much more like a sales event, even though there's a lot of technical content. There are some other topics uh, in the newsletter as well. Um, other topics include uh, free downloads and a community website, which we are talking about, uh, the availability of proactive notifications for customers of partners of CA, and we're uh, working on seeing if there should be a change to the enhancement request and ideas process. More details on those in the community newsletters, and uh, the link to that will be posted in the chat, and you can find it uh, uh, on the top of the page if you go to the IM community on the website. Then, uh, before handing it over to Stuart, I would uh, just want to say, uh, if you have questions, you can use the phone lines at the end or uh, you can post them in the Q&A. We'll try to answer as much as possible. And then it's over to you, Stuart. Okay. So um, today's presentation is not gonna be very long, but I will go into as much detail as anybody wants. So like Michael said, please use those Q&A panels. Um, a little bit of history on me, if you, if you don't know me, I, I'm like Michael said, I'm a member of the board on the community, so you've probably seen me online. Um, I've been working with the NetQS products since 2006, so I've, I've got quite a bit of history with them, and uh, the, the NAS tool, or the, previously known as the NFA parser, is definitely uh, one of the good ones to, to have knowledge about, so I volunteered to give this uh, presentation. So first of all, let's talk about what it is that the NAS tool is built to do. What, what problem is it meant to address? Um, 
primarily the NAS tool is meant to help us identify and get information about incoming flows, flows coming into the harvester. And the main reason we want to do that is because we want to separate our scope. We want to figure out if there is a problem with our flows, is it really with the flows or is it something inside NFA that maybe we haven't configured right or we've inadvertently discovered some kind of uh, previously unknown bug, whatever it may be. So uh, let me break down exactly what happens here on a, on a, in a normal situation. What you have is flows coming in from your device to the harvester, and the harvester service picks up sure, those flows. Uh, just one second. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we're not seeing the presentation anymore, I think. Just seeing your background. No, that is the presentation. <laughs> That's the presentation. Okay, oh, there it is. Okay, go ahead. I I recently uh, excuse me. I recently attended a class where they told us to minimize what we put on our slides. <laughs> so I'm giving it a shot. Okay. okay. <laughs> so so yes, you should see some big incoming thing that we need to get information about. Uh, I couldn't help it. There there are things moving in the entertainment world that have my attention. So. Um, yeah, so so there are things, the flows are coming into the harvester, the harvester service picks up those flows, uh, reads that data, and then dumps that data into NFA files on the harvester. And there's basically one NFA file for every, um, for, for every minute of data coming into the harvester. And somebody's advancing my slides for me. There we go. Um, so within, within those NFA files, those one minute data files, um, we can get details about the information in the flows. Now, there is a manual method to this. You can go in and you can use Wireshark, and you can decode the packets, and you can look for, uh, look for the data that's necessary. Now, so to break it down, there's essentially eight fields uh, that are required to be inside a flow in order for the harvester to actually pull out useful data. Um, without one of one or more of those those fields, if one or more of those fields is missing, then the flow that came in is pretty much useless. NFA doesn't have enough information to be able to fill out all of the minimum tables required to to store data for that flow. You can see the the fields here. Um, having the fields in a flow is re wasn't really a problem with version five NetFlow, but since version nine NetFlow is extensible, you can change the datagram. Um, it's quite easy. In fact, in a lot of cases, some vendors have, have inadvertently done it where they've left out or corrupted some of these required fields. And if those aren't there or if they're corrupted, then you don't get it. So you could, if you wanted to, you could use Wireshark, capture the packets, and then Wireshark has a built-in decoder that will decode the, the packets as NetFlow and then give you the breakdown of the information. Specifically for V9, what it will do is it will identify the packet as either a template or a flow. So the template itself uh, has the, the information about what fields are contained in the flows, and then the flows themselves contain the records. So what you can do is you can look for the template in Wireshark, and you can look to make sure that all of these uh, uh, fields are contained within the, uh, the, the packet itself, within the template. And if they are there, then everything should be working. Now, this is a lot of manual process. Uh, the nice thing is we can use the NFA parser to actually do a lot of this work for us really easily. Basically, what we can do is we can have the uh, NFA parser check uh, the incoming packets, let the harvester service decode those packets and store them in the NFA files, and then the NFA parser checks through those NFA files to pull out those eight required fields to make sure that everything's there. Now, a little bit about this tool. This tool is not released by the developers over at CA. It's had no QA cycles dedicated to it. Um, technically, you cannot open up a support case on this tool. You can open up a support case on NFA, and the support guys may ask you to use this tool, but if there is a problem with this tool, you're using it for your own purposes and something is not working right, unfortunately, it's not a supported tool. You can't go to support and have them help you with it. It also means that the version numbering is a little bit wonky. Um, you can tell that in the beginning, the version numbers did match the version of NFA, but eventually they started releasing newer versions of the parser, and the version numbers didn't match. So. The important thing to remember is that when you are working with an NFA parser or the NAS tool, make sure that you have the right version. 
um, because you can have, you know, if, if you try to run version 10 on version 9.2 NetFlow, then it's not going to pull out the right kind of data. It's not going to really result in anything. Okay, so uh, I think there we go. So this is what it looks like when you run the tool. You can download it uh, from the site. I'll show you. There's some resources that I'll point you to in a, in a minute. Um, but you can go to the website, download the file, and copy it to your harvester and execute it from the command line. When you execute it from the command line, the first thing it's going to prompt you for is the number of minutes that you want to process. Um, and this is just how many NFA files do you want to actually process. And the, the more you choose to process, the longer it's going to take. Um, and it also depends on how much data is coming into your harvester. If you have a really heavily loaded harvester, five NFA files could take a, a, you know, a couple of minutes to actually parse through. So you specify the number of minutes that you want to analyze. Um, another option that isn't really well documented is the batch mode. So you can actually execute the parser or NAST with uh, the dash dash batch mode. Sorry about that. And uh, with the batch mode, it will actually um, uh, execute kind of in headless mode. It, it won't uh, generate any output. It won't launch the IE browser at the end. Um, so you can actually put the NFA parser into a scheduled task. And I've actually built some mechanisms around that. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and then when it's all done, it will generate an HTML file. I'll go and show you that, that HTML file. This is what it looks like. This is the V13 uh, NFA parser output. Um, you can see, first of all, that it, it details which routers are sending flows. And then it also tells you up at the very top the total harvester flow rate. Now, the CA has some guidelines around uh, the number of flows per minute that need to come into a harvester, uh, the recommended load, if you will. Um, it's not very easy to find in the GUI, so the NFA parser makes it real easy. You can, you can find it right here. We've also got the number of interfaces per, per device detected, and you can also see what we call the red list. Red list is devices that may have problems. There's several reasons. I'll talk about why a device may show up in the red list, but basically there's a problem with that device. Then <clears throat> by clicking up at the top, you can go down to the, to the individual device section, and it will show you for each interface how much traffic you've seen inbound to that interface and how much outbound. And this is where the, the real benefit of the NFA parser comes in, is you can look at the output here and you can tell um, how much data is coming in for your interfaces. If you're expecting to see a certain interface and it's not showing up in the NFA parser, that means that it's not sending flows, right? And uh, if it's not sending flows, then we know the problem is with the device itself. If it is sending flows, but those flows are not showing up in NFA in the web GUI, then there's obviously some kind of configuration change we need to make in the web GUI to get that fixed. In later versions of the NAS tool, you can also see where it details the uh, any kind of problems with V9 templates. Like, for example, if there's a certain router that's sending flows but not including that template, it'll list it here. And I'll show you a, a live version of the, of the output here in a second. We can kind of go over it. So there's a couple of reasons why a device might show up in the red list. Um, first of all, the master console does SNMP to the devices. And if that SNMP has some kind of problem in communicating, that may cause the router to show up here in the red list. Um, also, each flow in, in NetFlow comes with the sysup time of the device. And this sysup time is actually fairly crucial for us to be able to coordinate when things are happening, when flows and conversations happen. Uh, so if those sysup time values are bad, like for example, if we know that the sysup time of the device is really high, but the sysup time in the flows is very much discontiguous, then we know that there's a problem with those flows and it'll show up in the red list. Each of the flows also has a sequence number. If those flows coming in are too much out of order, then it can cause a problem with us parsing those. Um, also, if there's a uh, the V9 template, if it's missing entirely, then that, that can cause the device to show up in the, in the uh, red list. Also, if there are fields missing, like I said before, with V9, there can be fields missing, or in the case specifically of the Cisco ASAs, many of you may have run into this, but if you look at the Cisco ASAs, um, you'll see that those devices actually, if, if you were to break that down into Wireshark, there's one of those required fields that's actually split into two. There's a, a 60, 
64-bit number, but they, instead of putting it as a single 64-bit number, they put it as two different fields, two 32-bit numbers, um, and they called it something different. So NFA doesn't know to look for that different name, and it also doesn't have the ability to take those two fields and put it back together. However, uh, there has been a notification from CA that that should be fixed in the next release of, of NFA, so that's a, a good thing for us. So there's a lot of cool things you can do with the output. This is one of the things that I did. I took the uh, the output of the NFA parser, that output that we looked at before with the red list and the, and the details for each one, and I dump that data into a database every day. I run the NFA parser as a scheduled task, and then I dump that into a custom database. And then when I want to run a report on that, I can pull out line charts like this that show me the uh, number of flows per harvester, the number of routers per harvester, the number of interfaces per harvester, and I can look for significant changes here to help me identify where I might have a problem with one of my harvesters. Like, for example, you can see that green line that suddenly drops off to nothing in that very first top left graph. That obviously is an indication that that harvester was having a problem, and in this case it was. That harvester's services were stopped. Um, yeah, so I'll move on to the next one. So. There's a couple of resources out on the community available. Um, the main one uh, is, is here in the middle of the NAST main document. That's where you can go and you can find out all the information about the NAST. I'm going to be linking this webcast to that document so you can view this replay. Um, there's also the How to Enable NetFlow document. Um, that's a very long document detailing for a bunch of vendors and models exactly what it takes to configure NetFlow properly for NFA. And then down at the bottom, that last document is how to use Wireshark to manually parse NFA or, or NetFlow packets and, and read those, read the template, how to read the data files themselves. Okay, the one thing I wanted to make sure everybody knew about this, I put up in the title that these resources are maintained by you. These are community documents. It's like Wikipedia. You can use these documents to... Um, to, you can update these documents, but you can also use them. If you have something that you would like to add to the document, feel free. Just go ahead and add it. It's kind of like Wikipedia. Anybody that has the information can go ahead and add that information. Um, so that's all I have for, for the official part of my presentation. Um, what I can go through now, if anybody wants to look at it, is I have um, in my own personal lab box here in the NPC, I actually took the NFA output that I schedule every day, that runs every day, uh, and I actually put that using the browser view into NPC. So essentially what I do is I create a page, and on that page I put the browser view, right? Just drop the browser view onto that page, and then once you can edit that view, all you need to do is point the browser view to the directory containing that NFA output. So I went in and created a custom IIS directory, drop my output in that folder every day, and then I can point to this, uh, this output every day, right? So if you look at this, you can see there, there again is my number of flows per minute. Um, that gives me a good idea of how many flows per minute, what the load is on my harvester. If that ever starts to creep up, um, then I know I've got, to, uh, I've got to address that, you know, somehow manage the load. I've got some routers that have some problems, and then down here I can see, for example, the interfaces that are sending data in some cases, we will have the uh, the SNMP name for the interface. It just depends on, on the interface. And in fact, in most cases, we should have that. Uh, and it'll also give you the utilization out here, because um, by SNMP, we can know that utilization. And then also over here, I've, I've got an example of how I took that daily run of the NFA, uh, out, NFA parser and then generate a long-term historical trend for that information. So. Anybody's got any uh, questions about how to do that? I can take that offline with you. But um, I did want to point out, uh, Dan Broska here from CA did mention that I did have one point wrong. The master console does not do SNMP. The harvesters do the SNMP. So just FYI. Um, wanted to know. Let's see. Let me take a look at some of the questions. So Joe asks, I know you import your NAST output into a DB. Why not import it into something like CA Performance Management or some other CA product user interface? Um, mainly I do it because I was building my own custom database anyway for, for long term. Um, I, there's not that great of an API for building your own graphs inside Performance Center. 
uh, either NPC or CAPC. So I haven't haven't tried doing that. I could have dumped this into the same database, into the NPC database, or into the, even into the NFA Master Console database. I just decided to put it into a separate database to keep things separate. All right. Uh, if you've got any other questions, I'm open for questions. Um, put them either in the Q&A or operator if you'd like to open up the audio line for questions. As a reminder to ask an audio question, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. At this time, there are no audio questions. Okay, so either I explained it perfectly or you're all in stunned silence. Um, I do see another question here in the Q&A. It says, are there any updated device NetFlow configuration guidelines, i.e. flexible NetFlow? So you can go to the community. I'll, I'll show you the, uh, the, uh, the device list here. If you go to the community and you search, let me get this out of the way here. You search for how to enable NetFlow. Your first result should be a document um, that is a fairly long document, and uh, look, I mean, by long, I mean long. It's a long document. So if you want to enable NetFlow, all you need to do is find the vendor section. There's, they're collected by vendor, so there's a section for Cisco. I know your question was specifically for the Nexus devices. So you can scroll down to, there is a section on the Nexus 1000, and there's the Nexus 7K. So it talks about everything you need to know uh, about configuring NetFlow. This, in my opinion, is the best guide because it pulls everything together and just about all of the instructions are in the context of how to enable NetFlow for NFA. So if there's any specific configs that you need to do to make sure that NFA gets the right kind of data, this is the place to go. Okay, any other questions? You can post them in the Q&A. There are no audio questions at this time. Um, there was a question in the Q&A asking for checkpoint configuration, so that's uh, checkpoint firewall. Uh, I don't know if there's anything on here about checkpoint. I haven't done it myself. It doesn't look like there is any information in the wiki about checkpoint configuration. So um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to help you with it. I, I don't know how to do it uh, because I haven't, I haven't done much with checkpoint firewalls. Um, but if you do find out that information, uh, please feel free to post it uh, in addition to this, uh, to this document because I, I don't see anything there. On NetFlow, there's another question on NetFlow V9, or sorry, NetFlow 9.2, um, NFA 9.2, is there an option to measure and report on device-device -device latency? Uh, no, there was uh, at one time plans to use NetFlow to get hop-to-hop uh, -hop latency, uh, but as far as I know, that has not been uh, implemented in the product. I haven't seen anything about it on for uh, over a year. Um, so right now, there's no way that I know of to, to get latency in there, although the information should be derivable from the, from the NetFlow packets themselves. There's just nothing in the product today that will do that. Uh, okay, so the question from Brian, do you run the NAST once a day to dump into your database? Yes, I run the NAST once a day on every harvester that I own, which I own uh, 11 or 12, I lose count. Um, but yes, I, I run that every day. Um, I try to pick a time that's going to be representative of uh, when that harvester is busy. So, for example, I run it uh, for, for my EMEA harvesters. I run those fairly early in the morning my time. I'm in central time zone U.S. So I run those fairly early in the morning. So it's kind of in the morning, but before things really get bus too, too busy. So I'm not really impacting anything. Um, for the U.S. harvesters, I do that, you know, almost first thing in the morning. For my uh, APAC harvesters, I do those uh, late in the night in my time, which is kind of early in the morning local time. But, yes, I run that once a day, and I dump that into my database. 
and I use I use Perl to do this. It's a pretty simple Perl script to uh, to pull it out. Um, I typically uh, because my on on my really busy harvesters, I run those for uh, one to two minutes. Uh, on some of my less busy harvesters, I run them uh, on for 10 minutes. So I analyze 10 minutes worth of data so I get a good sample size. Um, I find that for my really busy harvesters, if I try to analyze more than two or three minutes worth of data at a time, uh, it can take longer than I'm comfortable waiting for it. Um, <laughs> that's just when I'm looking at it and it's running, I don't like sitting there waiting you know, five minutes for 10 minutes worth of data to get processed. So I, I like to keep that short. Um, it would be obviously a, a best practice to try and get a good time of day and a good duration window that you're that you're parsing to make sure that you get a good good idea of, of what's actually happening on the harvester. Good questions. Good questions. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I used a, a simple plural script with regex to analyze the the HTML output. I parse out the different sections of that document, split it into the different fields that I need, and then just use a simple insert to insert it into the database with uh, timestamps. And then uh, I uh, write a simple uh, SQL queries to pull the data back out, give me my 10-day 10 10-day 10 uh, trend lines, my 10-day uh, line graphs here, and then I dump those into uh, the Google Chart API, the pretty easy and open uh, chart API that has a lot of controls that are enabled by default. So all of the, you know, putting these dots on here and the call outs and, and all that kind of stuff is really easy to do with the Google API. Any other questions? Good questions. Okay, so uh, we do have two questions here. Any utility you use to back up the NFA database? Yes, in fact, <laughs> uh, I wrote a, a utility. Uh, sorry, let me go to the right one here. <clears throat> so on my blog, uh, you can search, as soon as the search comes up, you can search for NQ Backup. NQ Backup is a little utility that I built that wraps uh, around support's recommended tool. Uh, so support developed a tool called dbtool v3, and dbtool v3 backs up the database, uh, it backs up any MySQL database while the database is running. Uh, and then I use this NQ backup script to actually wrap around that so that I can uh, give it some additional uh, features like rolling database backups. I can tell it how many backups I want to keep, um, uh, log file con uh, consolidation, all kinds of things like that. Um, so yeah, you can go to stuart.wenig.com and just search for NQ backup and you'll find information there. You can go to the CA support site to get a download for the DB tool. Uh, always use dbtool v3. There are some problems with dbtool v2 and the old db backup mt. Make sure that you're using v3, uh, no matter which version of NFA you're using. Um, okay, so there was a question, how to configure NAST with NFA? So there's not really a configuration for NAST. Essentially what you do is you use NAST to analyze what NFA is already doing. So you have your flows coming into NFA, NFA is trying to report on those flows in the GUI, you use NAS kind of like a packet capture decode on the harvester. So you copy it to the harvester, you run it, and, and that output tells you what's coming in. So uh, the question how to configure NAS with NFA is basically you copy it to the harvester and you run it from the command line or you can put it in a scheduled task if you like. Um, questions about there was a question on any plans to enable a migration of existing three tier to two tier NFA and 9.2. So that's the question for the wrong person. Uh, that would be a question for Martin Kowaleski, who is a product manager for NFA. Um, I don't know of any way to migrate from a three tier to a two tier uh, environment. Um, I think the recommended way today is to uh, set up a new two tier environment and, and replicate your flows and, and take care of it that way. Uh, but like I said, that's that's really not a question for me. I'm not. I don't work for CA. I'm not a product manager. Uh, I'm a user just like you guys. I've just been doing it for a long time.
there is a question in the chat. Let's see. Is it possible to check if index has been changed using NAS? Ah, oh, that's a good question. So um, looking at the NAS output, let me get this stuff out of the way here. You do see, uh, e even for the interfaces that show a, uh, a, a an interface name via that was obtained via SNMP, you can look at the SNMPF index. So particularly, if I'm not mistaken, the problem that uh, we're, we're referring to is where you have a router that is sending data and the interface index, which is the ID number that NFA uses to identify incoming flows and assign them to a particular interface, um, that ID number may change uh, over time. And there are things you can do to prevent it, and the how to enable NetFlow includes the commands that you need to do to implement to, to prevent that as the SNMP if index persists. Uh, but essentially, if, if you reboot a router or you you know, you power down your router, uninstall a, a module or a card, and you put in a new card, you upgrade an interface, the interface index number can change. And what will happen is the data in NFA, it will look like the old interface just completely stopped and a brand new interface started up because the ID number has changed. Um, and yes, you can verify that using the NAS tool because what it will show you here uh, is you will see, yeah, if index, for example, if index 364 may be my new if index number for the new upgraded interface, and uh, 363 may be the if index from the old interface. So by using the NAS tool, I could see, yep, the data for 363 is not coming in. The data for 364 is coming in, and by knowing a little bit about the router and looking at the uh, SNMP information available through NFA, you can actually tell you know, which interface is which and tie them together. And there is an option in NFA, if, if the if index does change on you, there is an option in NFA to go in and take the records for the old if index number and merge them into the records for the new if index number so that it appears as if it's one interface from beginning to end instead of two disjointed uh, uh, records in the database. I hope, I hope, Luis, that answers your question. Okay. Um, Dave asked, do I have any conversion table that would estimate flow rate from the bit rate of an interface for estimating purposes additional harvest are needed? No, uh, and the reason I don't have that is it's fairly impossible. Uh, there's no real good correlation uh, between the volume of traffic on an interface and the number of flows required to describe that traffic. Um, mainly because the, the amount of traffic you do, um, well, I mean, let me put it this way. If, if I have a conversation between my IP address and somebody else's IP address, and it's very small, uh, 10 kilobits per second, let's say, um, that very small conversation, you know, would take one flow to describe. It would say, my IP address is the source, my friend's IP address is the destination, here's the source address, destination address, source port, destination port, um, here's the uh, uh, the other information about it. And one of those fields would be the number of bytes that we exchanged. Um, whether I exchange 10 bytes or 10 gigabytes, it's still gonna be one flow that describes my conversation. So there's really no good correlation between volume on an interface and the number of flows required to describe that volume. Um, it's really all about complexity of the volume. If it's 10 people doing 10 kilobits per second or one person doing 100 kilobits per second, that's going to be a difference. In both cases, that's the same amount of volume. Um, but if it's 10 people, that's 10 different conversations, therefore at least 10 different flows. If it's one person, that's one conversation, that's going to be probably one flow. The best way to estimate whether or not you're going to need um, an additional harvester is to look at this number right here. Use the NAST output, look at the FPM, the flows per minute. That flows per minute gives you a good idea of act the actual complexity of the data. Um, and by looking at that, you can kind of have an idea if your harvester is too loaded, um, you know, there, I didn't look it up, but there are some uh, documents out on the CA support website that kind of detail the recommended flow rate for a harvester based on a particular set of hardware. Um, so if you have the recommended set of hardware and your 
doing double the recommended flow, then you would need at least one more harvester to cover that, maybe two more in order to have a little bit of uh, fudge factor in there. Good, good. I'm glad that answered your question. Uh, good questions, good questions. Um, keep them coming. Any others? Is the presentation recorded and will it be posted on the community? Yes and yes. Um, our webcasts are always recorded and they are always posted on the community. In the case of today's webcast, uh, we'll actually have two recordings. I, I generated a recording of this PowerPoint last night, which is you know, just my own vanity. I wanted to be able to do it perfectly so I could re-record it anytime I wanted. But we, we, are, we also record the WebEx and uh, as soon as I get the WebEx replay, it takes a little while for us to process that. Usually I have it up uh, the same day, if not the next day. So yes, we will have this presentation up on, on the, uh, the community. Um, the PowerPoint itself will not be. Uh, I hope you realize I didn't, I, I, you know, I purposefully didn't include a lot of information in the PowerPoint, but I will have a PDF of the PowerPoint included in the, in, in, on the community. So yeah, we'll have the PDF of the PowerPoint. Um, I'll even post some sample files up there that you can look at. Um, the re replay, and uh, there's all, there's also going to be a link to my YouTube channel where I'll have my own replay. Okay, any audio questions? Again, to ask an audio question, press star 1. At this time, there are no audio questions. Okay. Uh, I don't Stuart, think... uh, yeah, go ahead. Just so people know where to find it, uh, you will be posting the webcast replay info and anything that uh, comes with it in the community blog section, right? That's right. That's right. The way we've decided, uh, we had to kind of uh, figure out how we were going to do it on the new system, but the way we've decided to do it on the new system is there will be a blog post. And that blog post will have links to all the different pieces of content that are that are are now or will be on the community. So all the links that I mention, I'll put in the blog post. The uh, links to the videos, the PDF, all of that will be in the blog post. Yeah, and the easiest way to find it is just go to the IM community, and uh, you can go to the content section and. Uh, then you select blogs and you will find it there. Uh, same place where we have the webcast uh, replay for June and July. Yeah, there you go. There we are. <laughs> okay, let me check one more time and make sure there are no other questions. Of course, if you come up with a question, as I always do right after I hang up, uh, you can post it onto the community. Just post a question onto the infrastructure management community. I'm on here all day long every day, and I, you know, especially if somebody mentions me by name, I'll, I'll answer. Um, you may not like the answer, but I'll at least give you an answer. So uh, I'll Looks turn it like back to for today, huh? That's all I've got. Thanks, Stewart. Thanks for sharing your knowledge, and thanks everyone for your time. Uh, just once again, if you're interested in software-defined networking, even if you don't know much about it, uh, that's going to be our next webcast, which will be on uh, September 16th next month. Uh, with that, thanks everyone for your time, and have a good day. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.